So thank you so much for your nice introduction and I'm very pleased to be here because I'm in the headquarters of the company. I started my research. So this was the reason why probably we get in contact because I started my studies by using a lot of biorad reagents since the very beginning. And then I'm really glad to share with you some of the research project we ran in the last 10 years, more or less using a lot of your reagents technical supports and uh, protocols as well. So what I'm going to do this morning is try to give you an uh, easy background of Alzheimer's disease and mechanism of neurodegeneration and focus on protein oxidation because it's the main focus of our lab. And I will tell you about redox proteomics, uh, which I did a lot in US and then use the technology also in Rome, uh, using a lot of biorad products and instruments as well. And I will present some of the data we collected by applying redox proteomics to Alzheimer's disease brain and recently also to Down syndrome neuropathology. And also I will discuss with you and get some inputs and question whatever you feel comfortable for future perspective. We are currently running in the lab and eventually other expertise we will need to improve our research. So I think I'm not going to say anything that is novel to you uh, by showing you that Alzheimer's disease is considered the most common form of dementia in the elderly. And the problem is that people getting Alzheimer is going to increase uh, strongly every year. So we expected to grow till reaching 68% more in 2050. So this is going to be a big challenge for uh, both economy and for social care as well. And if we compare the economy of different countries, we can see that uh, the investment for treating and curing people with Alzheimer's disease can be compared to the economy of Apple and Google even more than that. Just to highlight what is the problem we are facing in science and how to improve treatment for people. And so far, even if there are many published papers, still I think we miss some fundamental aspects of the disease in order to be able to treat, which is based mainly on the possibility to work on prevention. This is going to be the most important aspect. That's why my group recently is really focusing on the early molecular mechanism that we believe are crucially involved in the early stage of the disease. So neuropathologically, you may know that the key pathological features of Alzheimer's disease are the position of uh, the neurofibrillary tangles made of uh, hyperfoliated tau protein, as well as the position of senil plaques made of uh, amyloid beta peptide, which is produced by the metabolism of a transmembrane protein, APP. So these are considered the markers of the pathology that can be detected only post-mortem. So there is another problem in diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease because we may eventually need post-mortem brain analysis uh, to be sure that we are talking about Alzheimer's disease. Anyway, we have many other diagnostic tools that have been improved recently that we eventually use to diagnose Alzheimer in the different stages, as well as the prodromal phases, which are known as mild cognitive impairment and preclinical Alzheimer's disease. These are the most common stages of the disease that are clinically diagnosed to detect even the early and late stage of the disease. So you may also look at the brain of course, the pathological Alzheimer's brain on the right side, as you can see, where we have a reduced volume loss. Uh, this is due to loss of neuronal cells, which is something that is uh, occurring uh, uh, very strongly in the AD brain, and it is responsible mainly of loss of cognitive function and memory. These are the most important cognitive functions that are impaired, and is the way we may eventually detect the very early sign of dementia is just due to memory loss, as you may eventually know from the general population. So if we look at the pathological markers of the disease, uh, you may see some of the markers increasing early in the pathology, like the red line uh, 
uh, referring to the increase of a beta production and the position in the brain to be one of the earliest pathological events in the Alzheimer's brain, followed by hyperphosphorylation of tau and formation of neurofibrillary tangles. And then this will affect brain structure, as I showed you, shrinkage, volume loss of the brain, which result, of course, in memory loss and in eventually all the clinical signs of dementia with the complete loss of uh, ability of daily living. That is the main problem, of course, of curing and uh, caring Alzheimer's patients. So if we want to look at uh, these pathological markers, I just show you some of the pictures to highlight what we are facing. We are facing the position of plaques, as you can see on the right, uh, on the left side of the picture, just these aggregates uh, which are deposited extracellularly and they may eventually uh, act as a sink, so also initiating other toxic reactions and participating to neuronal loss. This uh, deposition of plaques is associated with inflammatory response. Of course, any time we try to fight against any toxic events, you may know that we activate inflammatory response. So this is another typical marker of the Alzheimer brain, neuroinflammation. And then one of the aspects we are interested is also related to the increase of oxidative stress which is strictly related to the function of mitochondria. You may know to be the power station of the body. So being responsible of energy metabolism, production of ATP, and therefore being fundamental to allow all the synapses to work. Just to think about neuronal impulse to be uh, done by a lot of channels using ATP to uh, function properly. And the last one is just to show you the neurofibrillary tangles made of, as I told you, hypophosphorylated tau, which are the second major neuropathological markers of the disease. So basically, this is the picture of neuronals with uh, dendrites, which are crucial for neuronal transmission. We are going to face the loss of this connection. That's basically what happens in the neurons whenever you have the accumulation of plaques and tangles. And at the end, of course, this disconnection will be responsible of loss of condition and memory loss as the main clinical sign of dementia. So in my lab, we started focusing mainly on the role played by oxidative stress. This was the beginning of my studies. Uh, for the reason why uh, the brain has a lot of polyunsaturated fatty acids, I hope you are comfortable in understanding the structure of the membranes, meaning that neurons are highly vulnerable to oxidative stress. It's uh, the reason why we may eventually look at the increase of damage at the membrane level that, in, that is then transferred even inside the cell, initiating a cascade of reaction, which finally not only damage lipids, but also protein and DNA as well. In addition, the brain consumes oxygen at a very high rate, around 20%, and generate a lot of oxidants, meaning compounds able to easily attack other molecules, making damage. And this is due, of course, to the work of mitochondria, the major site of ROS production, this is also a physiological important aspect of mitochondria. So when I'm saying free radicals, you do not always be scared about that because we need free radicals to signaling a lot of message inside the cell. The problem is when we face an overload of free radicals that is not associated to the proper activation of antioxidant system, which at the end will result the unbalance between production and elimination of free radicals, which is what we call oxidative stress. And this is an aspect of many diseases. So I can tell you that it's not only occurring in the Alzheimer's brain, it occurs in all neurodegenerative diseases as well as in many other pathologies. Of course, having different targets, different specificity for the tissues, and of course, some specificity in the mechanism that are involved. And also the presence of transition metal is one of the 
chemical reason for activating and amplifying free radical mediated reaction. So in the context of Alzheimer neuropathology, if we go back to the um, main uh, toxic uh, um, compound, the amyloid beta peptide, what we studied and we demonstrated is the ability of the amyloid beta peptide 142, which is the toxic byproduct of the APP transmembrane protein, uh, is the fact that it's able to induce the production of free radicals. So the basic hypothesis of our studies was just to try to understand how the increased production of amyloid beta will in turn lead to the increased production of free radicals and eventually how this will affect the biology of the cell. Looking at proteins or eventually at DNA, RNA or lipids, but the interest of my group was to focus the effects of free radicals on proteins and that's why we uh, figured out this uh, basic idea that amyloid beta overproduction will lead to the uh, release of free radicals initiating free radical reaction. This is due also to the ability of a beta production if you look at the chemistry to activate and provoke the production of free radicals. This in turn we initiate first lipid peroxidation at the level of the membrane, the first site of the damage, but also downstream into the cell the uh, oxidation of other macromolecules. This is uh, what we will observe at the level of the protein by measuring some specific markers of protein oxidation which I'm going to show you what we did in terms of analytical uh, procedure to detect this type of modification that we selected based on the idea that was already demonstrated by other groups that this type of modification are irreversible type of modification, meaning that at the end the protein structure is affected most of the time with loss of function. So the idea is that Many other modification of proteins, as you may know, are transient, are reversible, meaning that we have couplet system attacking a group and removing just for signaling. These are not the case. This type of modification are irreversibly, meaning that at the end they will modify the structure and the function of the protein. That's why we were interested in understanding and identifying which protein is damaged in the Alzheimer brain in order to understand which mechanism is significantly compromised in the Alzheimer brain. And uh, to do that, this is the workflow we applied uh, through redox proteomics. At that time, I was a postdoc at the Professor Butterfield Lab at the University of Kentucky, which is the real pioneer of redox proteomics. So I just uh, had a wonderful experience in his lab and take advantage of his wonderful um, experience and uh, knowledge in the field. He is really a well-recognized scientist in Alzheimer's disease and started doing the same type of studies when I was back in Rome. And I can tell you that uh, Biorad approach was crucial to be able to set the same type of experiments once I was back in Rome. So when I joined the lab, I applied this approach, which I will show you briefly in terms of the basic and cru uh, crucial aspects of the workflow, which is the way to couple two-dimensional electrophoresis to two-dimensional oxyblot. So basically, once we process the Alzheimer post-mortem brain, just because in Kentucky, they have a really great brain bank, with short post-mortem interval, so they have type of samples which are really precious. They are the only one having this big facility getting continuously a lot of a deep brain that we can use for research. This was the opportunity I got, not only for Alzheimer, I was also involved in other projects having a lot of samples which were available at the uh, university. So, just to show you what are the main steps of this approach, what I did is the analysis of 
human post-mortem brain by specifically analyzing uh, brain regions which are mainly affected by Alzheimer. Specifically, you may know is the hippocampus, the one that is involved in cognition and memory, but not, not only the hippocampus. So what we did is to process the hippocampus from Alzheimer disease patients to compare the oxidation of proteins with LT controls, of course. And to do that, we couple two-dimensional electrophoresis with two-dimensional oxyblot to identify specific oxidation of proteins. And of course, we make comparison among the two different groups. And this is done through the PDQuest software, of course. And once we are able to statistically identify which spots are significantly different in the pathological condition compared to the LT controls, we are able to identify the spots on the gel, do digestion, send it to mass spectrometry, and get the identification of the protein. So just to briefly introduce you the basic steps that we do, of course, by using uh, all the isoelectrofocusing apparatus from Biorat at that time, I was in Professor Butterfield lab and all the uh, instruments and materials were biorad all the time. So I was used to running multiple gels and blots at the same time because this was the only way to get reproducible data, run the sample exactly in the same condition. This is an important aspect in science, the possibility to repeat the same condition while analyzing different samples. I think this is one of the limited <coughs> steps to be able to put together the individual variability, which makes sometimes scientists very hard to get significant results. So this is an important aspect I would like to underline because uh, we care a lot on the possibility and the need to reproduce what we have done the week before, what a student does and a different one will do as well. So, uh, this is uh, just the profile you know quite well, of course, uh, that we get by the combined separation by um, PI and molecular weight of the proteins. So the next step that we do, of course, is taking the image to evaluate the protein levels that are present. And among the different stain, we decided, of course, to use the most sensitive, which for us is the cyber ruby staining. So once we uh, stain the gel, we, um, of course, uh, take the image as the reference for measuring protein levels. Then I will show you what I'm doing uh, after this step. So this is uh, the analysis that we do always on the 2D profile to analyze differences in protein levels. Now there is a, a following step that we need for the 2D oxyblot that we do and we run on the same sample twice. One gel is for protein expression, the second one will be blotted with specific antibodies recognizing uh, the different modification. So we have the possibility to detect this type of modification due to the fact that some antibodies are available to recognize this specific modification. The one, the most famous recognized marker of protein oxidation is the carbonylation of protein. This is from Millipore, is the uh, leader for uh, this antibody. In addition, we are able also to recognize the formation of 3-nitrotyrosine. It's a specific modification of tyrosine residues on the protein. And again, we have different brand of antibodies that we can use. And of course, we tested them to choose the best one. And the other one is the modification of protein by the binding of hydroxynoninal, which is, you may know, the byproduct of lipid peroxidation. So once lipid peroxidation is initiated at the level of the membrane, as I told you, a lot of aldehyde are produced, very toxic, very reactive. Among these aldehydes, HNE is one of the most abundant and it can easily bind to several amino acid residues in the protein. Uh, of course, affecting, as I told you, structure and function. So that's why we focus on this specific modification. There are many others, for example, just to 
show you the importance of detecting uh, cysteine oxidation. Uh, you may do by 2DJ or many other approaches so far, which are very important uh, for uh, providing additional information as well. But these are what we uh, focus and what we used. So without going into details of the chemistry of free radicals, uh, just to show you what are the modifications we selected, formation of protein carbonyl, basically introducing, of course, carbonyl groups on the protein, and the fact that we need to derivatize this carbonyl on the protein by using the NPH reagents. This is the way usually used to detect this type of modification. The second one is protein nitration, as I told you, due also to the formation of uh, um, not only reactive oxygen, but also reactive nitrogen species as well, to be very crucial in this process. And we may use specific antibodies to recognize this type of modification. Protein nitration and formation also of HNE, as I told you, by the binding of the hydroxinoninal to specific residues on the protein, will be detected by using anti-HNE antibodies. So if we couple together the 2D profile of the gels for protein levels and the same for the 2D blot, this is the representative scheme that we run to analyze every time our samples. Meaning that I have to run always two times my sample to get the gel and to get the blot. And then compare the oxidation of the protein, of course, normalized to the level of the proteins, which is always another important element in understanding variation of protein. You always have to be able to look at differences in protein levels as well. And by combining this approach, PDQuest analysis is crucial to do that. So quite complicated, the way I was trained and also the way I trained my students uh, is a lot of work. I don't know who in the audience uh, is the one uh, working on PDQuest or eventually <laughs> <laughs> ameliorating uh, is not for everybody, I can tell you. Anyway, uh, there's a lot done also by the user. So the experience uh, always helping, of course. Uh, so that's what I fortunately learned uh, quite well, trained by uh, some of the postdocs in Professor Buttersville lab. So just to highlight the importance that you first run the comparison among the gels, then you run the comparison among the blots, you got a master gel, you got the master blots, and then combine the results coming from two these separate analyses. Then statistics will, at the end, after many, many uh, comparisons, uh, give you exactly the number of the spots on the gel that are significantly different among your pathological groups compared to the LT controls, you go back into the gel, you look at the spots, every spot on the samples to check the, the spots is there, to look at the value that are uh, corresponding to a spot, not the smearing or any other uh, unrelated uh, um, background that you may get. And then we cut the um, spots from the gel, digest with trypsin, and sent to our collaborators for identification by mass spectrometry. That's something we don't do in the lab. We use, and fortunately, we have good collaborators doing mass spectrometry to identify the proteins that we have uh, uh, isolated from the gels and digested them. So this is some automated system we do manually, because at the end, I can tell you that statistics will not give you a big number of proteins. If you adjust variation of protein levels, also differences between individuals in each group, then at the end, the spots that are significantly different among the groups are not really a big group. So we are able to do uh, the digestion, cutting the spot by manual excision. So after showing you the technique, the workflow. Uh, these are a complicated list of results we collected in collaboration with Professor Butterfields, of course, by having the possibility of using different type of region of the brain. 
hippocampus, the most important, but also the cortex uh, as the second uh, region which is significantly affected. Then we had the chance to apply the same approach on biofluids like plasma and CSF, just to look at peripheral system to see if there is match between brain results and uh, um, fluids. Then we also model the disease in mice and cell culture to see if we are um, having the same kind of uh, results in the different system just because we can treat cells, we can treat mice. So if we can reproduce in the mice what we observed in the brain, then we can use this model. Otherwise, there's no need or usefulness of uh, this type of mice or rats injected with a beta. So we collect a different system to study Alzheimer's disease to see if some treatment were able to recover the oxidation of the protein. This was mainly the idea of using uh, in vivo system and animals to be able to uh, prevent the accumulation of oxidative damage. And another important chance I got is also the possibility to analyze preclinical phase of Alzheimer's, meaning people with MCI that you don't know if they will get Alzheimer's disease. They are followed by longitudinal studies. By the time I did the study, we didn't know if they will eventually get Alzheimer or not. But this was important to see if there are some common mechanisms already altered early in the disease that may eventually be a marker uh, for prediction of onset of Alzheimer in these subtypes. And uh, just to show you some of the published paper we got by applying redox proteomics to the Alzheimer brain. This was one of the first projects to show you the specific uh, uh, identification of carbonylated proteins on Alzheimer's brain. You have on the right side the 2D blots compared to the 2D gels on the left side. You may also see that the control samples are on the upside while the down image refers to the D brain. So simply by your eyes you can see the increased um, color of the uh, blots of course of the pathological brain. So this was a visual uh, confirmation of what we expected since the beginning uh, based on the fact that we may expect uh, to observe increased oxidation of the protein. I will not give in the details of the protein uh, just later on while trying to summarize some of the data we collected in order to understand uh, what we have identified, what is the importance of identifying this protein in the context of the function that we believe are altered due to the presence of these functional proteins. And just uh, different uh, projects we run for identifying, in this case, nitrated proteins. So sometimes you may get the same protein with multiple modifications. So this is not surprising just because oxidation is, let's say, a very fast and uncontrolled mechanism. So you may also find the same protein to be carbonylated, to be nitrated as well. What is something occurring by just uh, overlapping results uh, on the different project. This was uh, the um, data related to the identification of HNE modified protein, uh, which Yes, yeah, you can see the quality of antibody when it is working really nice, then you don't get background easy to pick the spots just by visual inspection. So it's not always easy to get such kind of nice blots, but you know, every time we try to optimize, to eliminate the background, to be able to see clearly the uh, signal as probably showed the from these blots uh, related to the analysis of HNE modified protein. So now it's the time to put together this type of approach to understand what we found. So this is a list of the protein according to their function. And of course, the fact that we analyze different brain regions. So you may find some specificity of the damage in the region, either the hippocampus or the IPL refers to inferior parietal lobule and you see on the left 
the important function we think are mainly affected in the Alzheimer's brain. At the top is what we believe is crucial, all the enzymes which participate to the production of ATP, either by the mechanism of oxidative phosphorylation, you know the cellular respiration in the mitochondria, together with the glycolysis, the first way to use and metabolize glucose in the cell, are unpaired. So this meaning that we have a reduction of glucose metabolism and reduction of ATP production. And this is now well recognized to occur in all neurodegenerative diseases. And this is coupled to defects in antioxidant response. And also, just not to go into the list of functions that are compromised, is just to say that oxidative damage sometimes affect the proteins which should participate in the uh, defense against oxidative stress. And this is mainly the cause of dysfunction of the protein quality control, meaning proteins responsible of autophagy and UBS, ubiquitin proteasome system. We found that these systems are damaged. So meaning that the removal of damaged protein is itself damaged, meaning that it's not able to remove, to clear the accumulation of oxidative damage protein, as well as plaques and tangles. I'm going to go back on this aspect be because we believe uh, it's crucial uh, in many pathologies. So I did more or less the same type of studies also on MCI brain. And uh, just to briefly show you the main results we collected is based on the overlap of these two groups of protein just to see and to be able to identify which mechanisms are already altered in MCI brain, even before development of Alzheimer's disease. Meaning that, of course, just in MCI, a lot of functions are compromised, and these are in common with the function that we think are altered in Alzheimer's brain. What is hard is to just get numbers of the rate of reduction that can be observed and measured in the MCI brain compared to what you can observe in the Alzheimer's disease brain. Of course, we can imagine and figure out that we have a reduced loss in MCI that the chronic damage will eventually lead to a complete loss of protein function later on during uh, the uh, late stage Alzheimer's disease. And of course, uh, we are interested at the end in understanding not only that the proteins are oxidized, form aggregates. This is the major aspect in terms of protein chemistry. Once you add uh, uh, oxidative modification, the proteins are much more hydrophobic. They can easily aggregate, so they can also take part uh, to the aggregation process of amyloid or eventually co-localize in the plaques as well. Meaning that you get the loss of this protein. Once they are oxidized, you are not able to easily synthesize the new protein and of course you lose uh, the function of the proteins. So in order to focus on some of the pathways, we didn't get into details of all the proteins I showed you. In the recent years, we just focus the attention on some of them. And of course, we try to understand how the oxidation of the protein translates into the pathological uh, phenotype, meaning that we were trying to understand if we have the loss of the enzyme activity, if we have the loss of the uh, signaling protein among the network, in order to understand which are the other targets that are affected, not only the oxidized protein, but how this protein will eventually control other mechanisms into the cell. And that's the, just the example of some of the protein we measured after having identified the increased oxidation by carbonylation. Also, we were able to uh, demonstrate that this protein show decreased activities in terms of enzyme function, most of the times for 
those protein which we may eventually look at the enzyme activity mainly for the enzymes as I told you involved in energy metabolism. So just to couple that oxidation as I told you at the beginning is responsible of loss of function of the proteins uh, that you can measure by of course additional experiments confirming your data immunoprecipitating probing again the protein with anti carbonyl antibody that's part of the confirmation of the data we collect from mass spectrometry as well as also going much more into the detail of protein function as we can do by analyzing the activity of this protein and how we are doing now getting into details of the signaling network where they are involved. So we have also tried to apply the same approach not only to the brain but also to fluids because clinicians may ask us to be able to figure out what mechanisms are altered that we can identify in the biofluids, meaning uh, the samples that we can easily collect for diagnosis or eventually to test the efficacy of a treatment. It's kind of complicated. You may all know that a lot of specificity occur in the plasma, the blood, so it's not easy to say this mechanism is affected because it is in the brain. So now we are doing a step forward in order to be much more sensitive in the message that we want to get from the blood, but that can be referred to the brain. And I will tell you at the end what we are doing to isolate neuronal derived exosomes. So these are the approach we also did in the plasma by having a cohort of Alzheimer and MCI samples, together with also the chance to analyze CSF from a collaboration from Spain, again, to see some of the uh, oxidative pattern that we were able to identify in the plasma and eventually also in the, CC in the CSF. Both the studies confirmed that you find increased oxidation of protein in, uh, of course, MCI and the decompare to control. And some of these protein, I can tell you, some of them are proposed as biomass score in other studies. So the confirmation of our data, it was really important that same findings were also obtained in parallel by different approaches by other groups. So just to show you one representative studies that I did on the plasma, because it was very interesting, because just to add the, uh, additional elements a scientist should provide to prove uh, your data. So this was the results we collected by uh, redox proteomic studies, referring to the oxidation of one protein that we found to be more oxidized in MCI and a D brain. So what I did in order to understand the role of this protein, I took the purified proteins, I oxidized it like I found in the brain and I tested its function, for example, because this is a chaveron protein participating in the elimination of Ibeta in the blood. So we try to test it if we do the same in vitro, uh, if we modify the protein, if we add carbonyl group, if the protein may lose its ability to um, anti aggregate and eliminate and beta. That's what we did, not showing you the test uh, based on the aggregation properties of a beta, which is uh, counteracted by the functional uh, aptoglobin. Once this is oxidized, you can see on the graph that a beta aggregation goes very fast, meaning that you lose the ability of counteract its aggregation also in the plasma as well as may, it may occur in the brain. And once again, this protein is listed among some of the possible biomarkers of Alzheimer as well, because the loss of its function may be indicative of loss of the ability of extracellular chaperons to fight against accumulation of the peptide also in the fluids. So now in the second part of my talk, I will try to be uh, quite fast. I just would like to share some of the challenging studies I'm running because uh, we had the collaboration with uh, 
a group of scientists uh, first giving us amniotic fluid from Down syndrome pregnancies. That's what I did at the beginning in Rome. And at that time, I was pregnant as well, so I was like, okay, that's exactly how I made this collaboration with the doctor uh, in the hospital. I can tell you, while doing the analysis, I, I was, can you give me amniotic fluid uh, to do my analysis? That's what, <laughs> that's what we did. Fortunately, my baby is perfectly fine, but you know, at that time I experienced the stress of diagnosis. I see that your country is completely different. We undergo a lot of uh, uh, preclinical diagnosis uh, in uh, prenatal uh, um, screening a lot in Italy, even too much. Anyway, yes, that's a concern of uh, our country, of course. But at that time, we were able to collect uh, some amniotic fluid from uh, trisomic uh, pregnancies, and we were able to see also an increase of uh, damage of protein in the amniotic fluid compared to the LT controls. So after these first studies, uh, reinforcing the idea that other pathologies are associated from the early increase of oxidative stress already in the very early stage of life, participating in what we believe uh, is a driving force of neurodegeneration, we were able to analyze also Down syndrome neuropathology because I don't know if you know that Down syndrome individuals uh, develop around 40, 50 years of old a type of dementia that closely resembles Alzheimer's disease. So, so far I'm going to the conference because there's a lot of attention in US on Down syndrome population because it's a prodromal ID. So if I'm going to study Down, I can understand the mechanism of neurodegeneration because I know these patients will get Alzheimer. So I started with the amniotic fluid, but while talking with my boss in the US, we were saying, okay, I can get you <laughs> human brain from Down syndrome. We have a collaboration. I can send you in Rome Down syndrome brain, and you can eventually run the redox proteomics on the Down syndrome brain as well as we did on Alzheimer. The advantage of this wonderful collaboration was also that I have Down syndrome before Alzheimer and uh, also the group of adults having uh, the Alzheimer's disease. So I was able to compare young down individuals with old one, the one without, with those having Alzheimer's neuropathology. So this was the first uh, opportunity to look at the effects of Down syndrome neuropathology by being able to make this uh, great comparison. I'm not going into details of the genetic of the disease, which offer a lot of opportunities also, I think, with you to analyze some of the genes that are triplicated, but I may eventually just stress one because I think without knowing anything about Alzheimer's, you may find on the chromosome 21 APP. So the protein responsible of production of amyloid beta is encoded on chromosome 21. That's one of the main reasons all the community think they are going to get Alzheimer. We have many, many experiments also by deleting APP from the mice and see that the mice will develop Alzheimer. So just to complicate, so it is not only APP. APP is for sure the driving force of neurodegeneration, but there are many other genes triplicated that participate to the neuropathology in these patients, just to tell you and to share with you that's a lot of research going on on this disease, not only for cognitive disabilities, but also for the possibility to manipulate genetically mice, cell, and being able to look at specific genes together with all the genes as well. Anyway, triplication not necessarily means that you have always the overexpression of the genes. So you may know better than me, that every time you think about triplication, you should check the gene expression levels in the tissue you analyze in order to understand the tissue specific effects of triplication of the chromosome. Also because the triplicated genes will affect also the expression of disomic genes as well. Just to say studying neuropathology in Down is quite complicated because you may have some negative genes driving Alzheimer, but also 
some positive eventually helping in the cell rating. So what is interesting in this model, they get plaques and tangles around 10 years old in the brain, but then they will get Alzheimer at 50 years old. So there is a long gap when you have the neuropathology markers, but you don't have the disease signs. This is part of the secret of the chromosome, as I told you, having also some positive genes, uh, let's say regulating. Anyway, down is a model of accelerated aging. You have the early onset of Alzheimer's disease uh, because the mean uh, age of down population is around 65 so far. And also in the last 10 years, the life extension of these individuals is really increasing uh, due to medical care, to a lot of also social care, and you may eventually experience now how the mean age of Down syndrome is really high. They can get around 65, 70 years, but they are all demented. So this is a really big problem for the families. Taking care of son and daughters having Alzheimer when the parents are very old, it is the inverse in the Alzheimer population. You may think about the complexity of this disease. So I'm trying to be a little bit faster in uh, just giving you the commonalities between Alzheimer brain and Down syndrome brain, just to start from what we feel at the beginning to be the common, the generated pathways related to oxidation of proteins. So what we did, of course, is was immediately running redox proteomics on our brain samples. But here, as I told you, we have four groups, young down, young with dementia, compared with the age measure controls, always. So this is complicated. You have also to consider difference in age. Anyway, when you look at the comparison, which is a one-to-one -one group, of course, because you have to adjust for the age differences, you have different comparison that you can run and analyze. First one is what you observe in the Down syndrome brain at 20 years old was the mean age of our sample. These are the defects which characterize Down syndrome phenotype independently from Alzheimer's disease. And we have a lot of oxidized protein already present. Then we do the same by analyzing Down syndrome plus AD, the SAD group with the control old. So this was the phenotype that we expect to be very similar to the Alzheimer. So this was exactly what we may look at in the Alzheimer brain and the down brain. And then of course, we made the comparison over aging, down versus down with dementia, in order to understand which protein may eventually drive neurodegeneration. Of course, subtracting those one that are different between control old and control young. When I say control old, these are simply 55 years old. So we didn't find any uh, significant increase of oxidation because I can tell you that 55, we are young. So we don't really accumulate a lot of oxidized protein. So I can just uh, <laughs> think that these are not really old patients. So <laughs> by doing that, I convince you that what means to be old is over 80, so <laughs> no problem for all of us in the audience. What is very interesting from the table, left side is the first group, defects already present in the Down syndrome without neuropathology. The right side is all the proteins identified in the Down plus dementia, meaning those reflecting what we found in the Alzheimer brain, and in the middle are those eventually participating in the progression of the disease, meaning that the protein was found to be oxidized in all the group of comparison. I highlighted what are the main interests of our lab, which are the protein responsible of the function of the gravity system, as I told you, protosome and autophagy, as well as those involved in energy metabolism. So by putting together in the review what we found in Alzheimer, what we collected in Down syndrome, this is a summarizing picture showing you some of the defects that are in common between Alzheimer and Down. There are a lot, but these are the most important, we believe, 
to be responsible of some of the common features of Down and Alzheimer population just to highlight uh, these uh, specific differences. Uh, and as a biochemist, I do teach all this pathway, ask my students to know everything about glucose metabolism, ATP production. So this is the core of my studies, what I really like, and I'm going also to explain why we should take care of that. So we want the mitochondria to be able to process correctly glucose uh, in order to produce ATP. So. Why it is so important? Uh, this is really our energy. So if we lose uh, ATP production, uh, many functions, not only the one that I explained, but many others which are responsible of Alzheimer, in addition to what I listed, are compromised. And uh, this is again the list of the mechanisms that are recognized to be very important in Alzheimer's disease. But what we are currently doing, based on these results, uh, is focusing on energy metabolism. And this is the opportunity to share with you what is really important to understand, the risk of getting Alzheimer, which are the disease we know are associated to the risk of developing Alzheimer disease. You may know among these are diabetes and obesity. Why? Because both these condition are characterized by loss of metabolism, meaning that the failure of energy metabolism is a central mechanism driving a condition that is known as insulin resistance. I think you may know what I mean. That is characteristic of diabetes, that is characteristic of obese patients, but it's not only occurring in the liver. As you may expect, it occurs to regulate release of insulin and uptake of glucose, it occurs as well as in the brain. But you know the importance of insulin in the brain? I hope so, but I will just highlight that the discovery of insulin activity of the brain is a quite recent uh, information. So by the time uh, it was found, the number of papers were increasingly uh, growing uh, to study the role of insulin in the brain, the fact that we are able to detect all the mediators of insulin signaling in the brain as it is uh, in all the peripheral system, if we look at the liver or the muscle to be controlled by these hormones. You know everything about the control of metabolism by insulin, the importance of the release of insulin after a meal to activate the metabolism. The same is in the brain, but it's even much more, because in the brain, insulin also controls synaptic function, neuronal outgrowth and cognition. So this was really the novelty. I'm saying this because some of you may know that the only ongoing clinical trial nowadays in the US is only one, the insulin treatment, the intranasal insulin treatment which is uh, supervised by Professor Susan Kraft. So we may all be aware that most of the treatments in Alzheimer failed. So this is the only, also the anti-beta antibodies and many treatments against amyloid beta completely fail. So this just to stress that there is a lot of, uh, let's say, hope and uh, positive uh, thought about the possibility to use insulin to control what? The metabolic defects of the brain, which regulate amyloid production and clearance, as well as tau production and clearance. These are a novel aspect that we are investigating based on what is known to be this pathological condition in diabetes and in obesity meaning that insulin resistance refers to a condition when, of course, you lose the efficiency of the insulin signaling pathways. And this is due to the fact that you may have toxic compounds uh, altering the signaling at different levels. So this is just to complicate a little bit the biology of this mechanism. But what is very important in the field of Alzheimer's disease is the fact that we were able, together with other studies, to demonstrate 
the presence of insulin resistance in the brain. This is not necessarily associated with insulin resistance at peripheral levels. So you may know that 50% of people with diabetes have increased risk to develop Alzheimer's, double of the general population, as well as it is for obesity. So there should be a direct link between the development of peripheral insulin resistance with the brain. Anyway, we may also know that a lot of AD patients do not have diabetes. They are not obese. So you may get insulin resistance in the brain independently from the periphery. What is important is to understand uh, how defects in insulin signaling are responsible of altering the processing of AEPP and tau. This will of interest uh, to uh, Alzheimer's uh, community. And also just to highlight the very novel data, which I really interested is also the fact that we may be able to measure these insulin resistance markers also in neuronal derived exosome, meaning that this exosome carry a lot of the proteins which are expressed in the brain and correlate with defects in the brain. That's the advantage I hope this type of samples will offer the community to make a lot of studies. So I think I'm a little bit late. Are you fine with more time? Uh, or if you are tired, I can try to <laughs> shorten the data. I'm yeah, we've gone past the hour. Um, does anyone need to excuse themselves for an 11 o'clock meeting? Just because I don't realize time sometimes while talking. Oh, yeah. Anyway, I will try not to be uh, very long. Just to highlight uh, one of the findings uh, we believe uh, to be interesting in the context of insulin resistance made from the lab based on the fact that this is something you may find in all the biochemistry book or any book. This is the insulin signaling I think you need also for some of the panels you are able to analyze. So we propose and we add to this picture one novel mediator which is the biliverdin redotase, an enzyme with uh, pleiotropic activities that we believe uh, is part of these signaling pathways. Uh, so we started analyzing how this protein control the insulin signaling, how it eventually participate to the onset of insulin resistance. Just because it's part of the regulatory loop at the level of the main player in insulin signaling, which is the IRS1. So is the substrate of the insulin receptor, which is considered the marker of insulin resistance when you measure its inhibitory phosphorylation. Just if you look at many papers, if you want to detect insulin resistance, they simply give you the level of inhibition of IRS1 by cell phosphorylation. Of course, we need to add much more information. It's, I don't think it's sufficient to get an idea. So anyway, this is still recognized to be the marker of insulin resistance. But the fact that we are proposing a novel mediator is due to the fact that this protein, biliverdin redatase A, will control the activity of IRS1, eventually preventing physiologically its overactivation. So I'm talking about defects, but you should also consider that when you have an overactivation of the signal, this will be responsible of dampening as a mechanism of feedback control. So you may need to have a protein acting to avoid hyperactivation. Also because now we know that insulin resistance, which is characterized by inhibition, at the very early stages is characterized by hyperactivation of the signal. So these are the novel aspects many scientists are uh, interested in understanding uh, this hyperactivation phase followed by inhibition. So which are the mechanisms responsible of this shift and how we may eventually control this aspect. So without going into the details of this protein, which we published many papers uh, recently to highlight its role at different levels. So it not only acts on IRS1, but is also able to interact with AKT to modulate the activity of GSK3 beta, another crucial player in Alzheimer's disease. What I would like to share with you 
is that we took advantage of transgenic mice of Alzheimer's disease, the triple transgenic mice from La Ferla's lab, and we wanted to understand the onset of insulin resistance you can do on mice, because these are the only models you can follow as a function of aging. So that's the importance. And we were trying to figure out these two different phases, hyperactivation, then inhibition, and we wanted to understand where we can act therapeutically to prevent the onset of insulin resistance. So first we took the mice in the first study and we characterized the onset of insulin resistance and also, of course, the specific role played by this protein that I forgot to tell you, we also found first to be modified in the Alzheimer brain and uh, we may look together at what I underline to be for us a very interesting aspect. To look at the first hyperactivation when the protein is down and then this hyperactivation of IRS1 meaning that you have an overactivation of the signal which is negative as well as the inhibition. So you want to have a physiological uh, um, rate of the signal. Either inhibition or overactivation are uh, both negative. So then while mice are aging and at 12 years, uh, 12 months of age, these mice develop Alzheimer. You see you have the complete inhibition of IRS1 and you have consistent marker of insulin resistance. So based on many characterization we did on the mice, cognitive tests, all the insulin signaling and a beta and tau, just to understand the association of the signaling with the pathological aspect of the disease. This was all the data confirming also the increase of oxidative stress in our models. What I want to show you briefly is the last and recent uh, research that we did on the mice. So based on these uh, ongoing trials and the fact that it was uh, started without knowing details of the mechanism through which insulin is um, possibly inhibiting uh, or eventually decreasing the rate of the development of Alzheimer's disease, we decided to use the same strategies on the mice. So we may all know the failure of drugs in Alzheimer's disease mainly for the reason I shared with some of you yesterday, we are using the drugs too late. So in the second part, when you already have the clinical symptoms, uh, you are using disease-modifying drugs, uh, but it's hard to recover uh, the pathological phenotype. Uh, we may think about late intervention or only some partial relief of the patients, uh, but we are not able to treat at all the disease. So I think uh, what is going to be very important, but very challenging, of course, uh, is to identify the very early stages, the very asymptomatic one, when you may eventually look at some markers in the blood, in the CSF, by PET imaging, becoming neuroimaging, very powerful, to be able to detect very early signs to design future therapy. I believe this is going to be the only option that we have together with the idea of combining drugs. I don't know why there are not many clinical trials using multiple drugs. You have a multifactorial disease. You cannot target only one mechanism. You have to target multiple. Otherwise, you may get just a partial recovery, not really ameliorate the quality of life of patients. So uh, just to go back uh, to these important trials ongoing in the US, uh, what we did and was really challenging was treat the mice by intranasal treatment, uh, giving insulin, the one that we get for Alzheimer's just in the pharmacy. We collect, we select the dose uh, based on a lot of pilot studies and also from other published studies suggesting uh, which dose uh, may be effective. And we had two groups of mice. I'm just showing that we tried early treatment and late treatment. Uh, to see the efficacy of the drug at different levels before the onset of neuropathology and also later when the pathological 
future are already consistent. So just briefly to highlight that the treatment was um, very powerful in, first of all, recovering what we think are an important player in the regulation of insulin signaling, our protein, biliverdin redatase. So this was, as I showed with you in the characterization of the mice, some of the protein that are unpaired in the very early stages. And we were able to see the recovery of the phosphorylation of the protein at its activatory sites to be uh, reached after the treatment of the mice by insulin treatment. And this was associated also to the recovery of insulin signaling. So once we proved, after also having run cognitive tests, this is the first things that we do on living mice, before sacrificing them and analyzing all the different brain regions of interest. This has been done on the hippocampus. We were also able to uh, demonstrate the recovery of the insulin signaling in our mice treated with insulin. And of course, this recovery was associated with also uh, the uh, correct metabolism of APP and tau by measuring the reduction of a beta production as well as decreased tau phosphorylation. So just to highlight the possibility of using insulin to restore insulin signaling and downstream controlling the metabolism of both A beta and tau. So we are going to share this data also with colleagues in US just because we are already having a lot of collaboration to prove what they are doing in humans also in other models. You cannot get all this data on humans because of course you may analyze different type of samples. So we know the limits of my studies but we still know that putting together all the information will help to get a complete overview of the sign. I'm just going to finish with few information about what we are doing now and what I hope you may help me to improve the analysis of neuronal derived exosomes. These traveling exosomes, which are released by different cell types in the blood as messenger protein, as potential source of biomarkers as well. So we uh, performed the, the uh, step of isolation based on the normal protocols that are published also by one of the most important groups working on exosome in Alzheimer and Down. And of course, this will require uh, just uh, uh, affinity chromatography separation to isolate first the total exosome and then the neuronal subtypes that we have to characterize also for the sites by dynamic light scattering to always be able to confirm the quality of the exosomes. So in these very first preliminary studies, we went directly through our targets. So we selected what we think are interesting in the studies I showed with you that we can eventually observe in our patients. What is interesting that to do that, we had this collaboration with the pediatric hospital in Rome, very famous hospital, having a big court of Down syndrome children. So we are this time analyzing young population. So we may find something different, we don't know. But we were interested in starting this new collaboration with our colleagues. So that's why we decided, let's see what we can find in this exosome in the children from Down syndrome. And just to show you that we didn't see all the changes that we observed in the old individual, but we were able, for example, to see the um, impairment of all the the insulin receptor. So this was a novelty for us. So we couldn't see the inhibition of IRS-1, which I stressed you before, to be very crucial for the insulin resistance mechanism. And also our protein, the biliverdin, so far in the exosome, they do not show alteration. But we found a defect in the insulin receptor. So the levels of the receptor are decreased. So this may be eventually a future of the young children that may eventually turn 
into another phenotype later on in life. So what we are interested is also, of course, um, to analyze other type of samples from Down syndrome. We have many clinicians uh, collaborating with us to undergo a longitudinal studies to see if we may observe other changes at different ages. So just to highlight that, of course, in the very early stage of life, uh, you may look at different markers without knowing exactly what is going on later. So that's exactly what we will do once we may collect also samples from different ages. And we also already have some down with Alzheimer that we collected from the hospital in Rome and we are running uh, uh, isolation and uh, analysis. So, so far we don't have uh, new data to show you, but I hope uh, we can get easily. So this is also associated to the effects of some synaptic protein that we found to be altered in this exosome as well. Just to figure out that we couldn't find the same alteration of the brain, but also we were able to find other alterations strictly connected to the pathway. So sometimes you don't find exactly the same marker, but you find marker which are always in the same network, just to highlight that the mechanism is conserved, it is compromised, but sometimes on a specific target, later on can be other targets. So just to get an overview. So I need to briefly and uh, fastly go to what I would like to share with you. These are just a summary of the studies that I presented you, showing the redox proteomics, uh, all the biorad technology that I applied to identify oxidized protein as well as a lot of Western blood that we run for analyzing the insulin signaling pathways uh, using total load uh, as uh, the very recent approach we use for normalization of protein that we run and that we believe uh, is very powerful for the analysis and for the correct uh, uh, identification of the changes we believe to be important uh, in our models and the fact that the failure of energy metabolism is one of the key aspects of neurodegeneration that should be taken into consideration when we also look at other very important and very uh, widespread diseases like diabetes as well. It's like the economy of Alzheimer as well, even more, because you may know how many people is diagnosed daily with uh, um, with diabetes. So these are the projects ongoing in the lab, focused on insulin resistance by characterizing other aspects, which I could not have the time to the, uh, discuss with you, uh, running from uh, role of microRNA in the insulin signaling, uh, other modification of protein uh, as all glycosylation of proteins, uh, which are strictly related to glucose metabolism. We are modeling uh, these with the high fat diet on mice to understand uh, the specific role of obesity and diabetes on the mice. Of course, to understand the mechanism linking uh, metabolic disorder to neurodegeneration, as well as focusing on uh, one main interest, uh, the oxidative stress, uh, by looking at different aspects related to triplication on one transcription factor, BAC1 on chromosome 21, regulating NRF2 response. We are also interested in understanding the dysfunction of uh, UPR uh, and autophagy and how we may eventually also treat mice by uh, specific uh, drugs acting on autophagy pathways. And also recently we had the opportunity to run redox proteomics also on isolated mitochondria from our mice. That's going to be very important to characterize the metabolic defects that I showed you before. We do that on human postmortem brain. We do that on our mouse models. We do that also on cell culture, either the primary neurons and astrocytes that we can collect from, isolate from the mice as well.